was preaching at a graduation ceremony and service rather at, uh, in the United States some years ago and a man about my age came and asked to see me afterwards. When he came into the uh, office where I was, he suddenly broke down in tears. As the story unraveled, he told me about he'd gone to Vietnam in his youth. He thought the war was wrong. In fact, he thought war was wrong. In fact, he thought killing was wrong. And so he believed he should have resisted the pressure to go, but he lacked the courage of his convictions. And so he got conscripted into the army and he thought, well, I'll never be sent to Vietnam. And he was sent to Vietnam and he thought, well, it won't matter because I'll never go to the front line. And so, of course, he was taken into the very front line and it was a question of be killed or kill. And so he killed. He came home and never again could he look God in the eye. Never again could he go to church, never again could he pray, never again could he profess Christ or read the Bible. His deeds didn't permit him to return to God. If you're a newcomer amongst us, we do welcome you to Bible study. We're looking through the book of Hosea. It's on page 911, as Mandy just read for us, and there's the green outline, which will tell you what we're going through in this next little while as we work through Hosea chapter 5. You can see from the beginning here, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the geography and history, which you need to understand to understand this chapter that is behind, before us. So, the history in a very quick thumbnail sketch, starts back, say, with the 12 tribes of Israel settling into the promised land of, Can of Canaan or Palestine. Each of the tribes was given a different area to live in, to live and to pass on to their children. And about 1000 BC, they were united under the king. There were three kings they were united under, firstly King Saul and at 1000 BC, you don't have to remember many dates, but that's an easy one, 1000 BC, King David ruled over them all, and then his son, King Solomon. But after Solomon, the nation divided into two. They were known as Israel in the north and Judah in the south. They were surrounded by other nations like Moab and Ammon and the rest, but they were the 12 tribes of Israel in two kingdoms, the northern kingdom retained this name Israel, though sometimes it's called by the name of the leading tribe, that is Ephraim. And so it's sometimes called Israel, sometimes called Ephraim, just to confuse modern Bible readers. Its first king was a man called Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and the split happened around 930 BC. It lasted for a couple of hundred years before it was destroyed by the Assyrians in 722 BC. The southern kingdom of Judah lasted a lot longer. It was threatened by the Assyrians around 700 BC, but it survived the threat unlike the northern kingdom of Assyria and continued for an, over another 100 years until it was destroyed by, by the Babylonians. The first king was Rehoboam, who was the royal family. He was the descendant of Solomon, the son of Solomon, the so grandson of David and he reigned from the time of the split in 930 till his death. The kingdom was finally destroyed by the Babylonians around 587 BC. And so this is the kind of map and time of Hosea. For Hosea wrote around 750 BC. The destruction of the northern kingdom was going to happen in just 20, 30 years time the southern kingdom has already gone off the rails as well, but it would survive the Assyrian conquest. At Hosea's time was a time of enormous wealth and prosperity and peace, the last of the prosperity, wealth and peace times for the northern kingdom. It's hard to imagine that in 30 years your whole economic system can be destroyed unless you've lived through the last 12 months in Sydney and then you realise how quickly the whole thing can collapse. 
but they were assured, they were living in safety and security, and they couldn't imagine that Israel was about to be shattered. Hosea was warning, especially the border towns, in chapter 4, we saw last time Gilgal and Bethel were referred to. In chapter 5, we read of some of the other ones just on the south side of the border, Mitzpah, Gibeah, Ramah, they're all there in chapter 5. These were the places that in wealthy times would be tempted to join with Ephraim and the northern kingdom, but when the Assyrians came, would be the first places that of Judah to be attacked. So turn with me to chapter 5 and let's go through it section by section and see who's at home. For the nation's high places and shrines are described in the first two verses as a snare and a net. Hear those, O priests, pay attention, O house of Israel, give ear, O house of the king, for the judgment is for you, for you have been a snare at Mizpah and a net spread upon Tabor, and the revolters have gone deep into slaughter, but I will discipline all of them. The northern nation of Israel is called to attention because the nation is coming to judgment. And the high places of Mitzpah down in Judah and Mount Tabor up in the north have ceased to be the centres and shrines of the worship of Yahweh, but rather have become a trap and a snare for the people. They've become a trap and a snare for God's people, for they've given themselves over to Canaanite worship, sacrificing to all manner of gods. We, we associate great moments of God's history with places, with occasions, with events that happen. But the place where salvation breaks through in one day, in one generation, can become a place of idolatry and God's rejection in another day, in another generation. Tabor, Mitzpah, they were important in the history of Israel, but now they'd become a trap. Now they'd become a net. But the people in Hosea's day, they were unable to find the Lord. For there's no way home for Israel and there's nobody at home for Israel. So if they were to go home, they would find nobody there. God knows them. He is their God. He's betrothed to them in marriage. He knows Ephraim, the northern kingdom of Israel. He knows how adulterous his bride is, how for money she's put out her favours, what a whore she's become. He knows. Consequently, there's no way home for her. You see, there's a joke that goes around, it used to be on T-shirts and the rest. Jesus is coming. Look busy. As if... Jesus is kind of like the school teacher or like the father who has no idea what you're doing, but when he walks in, he will see. God knows what is happening. He knows them. He is their husband. And they have become a whore. And so we read in verse 3 and 4, I know Ephraim. Israel is not hidden from me. For now, o Ephraim, you have played the whore Israel is defiled. Their deeds do not permit them to return to their God, for the spirit of whoredom is within them, for they know not the Lord. Here is the problem about going home. Their deeds do not permit them to return. Ah, friends. This is so sadly true of many people having made a bad decision, having taken an action against their conscience, they no longer feel any freedom to go home. It's the problem of the prodigal. We've run away and life has become bad. We want to go home, but we're too ashamed to. We're too embarrassed to. We are too guilty for what we have done. There is this stupidity abroad, which thinks that I won't repent till later, till on my deathbed, which assumes that I will always be able to repent. I will always be able to turn back, but sometimes you do deeds that do not permit you to turn back. 
They hold you in prison because they have become you. Well, if it is you, there's great news for you. But there's not great news in the next verse. Actually, the next verse makes it worse. For just as in verses 3 and 4 that tells you there's no way home when you're imprisoned by your own behaviour, verses 5 to 7 tells us there's no one home when you do get there. Verse 5, the pride of Israel testifies to his face. Israel and Ephraim shall stumble in his guilt. Judah shall also stumble with them. With their flocks and herds they shall go to seek the Lord, but they will not find him. He has withdrawn from them. They have dealt faithlessly with the Lord, for they have borne alien children. Now the new moon shall devour them with their fields. How awful. Can you imagine being the prodigal son, finally reaching the point with the pigs where you decide, I'm better off at home as a servant than I am sitting here. So you go home only to find that the home has been sold. The family has left. There's nobody to forgive you. There's nobody to accept you. There's nobody to receive you back. There's nobody to restore you. Israel and Judah in their pride, in their power, in their wealth, in their affluence and assurance, Israel and Judah have stumbled in their guilt. And so they go to seek the Lord, but they will not find him, for he has withdrawn from them. They have been faithless like a wife, turning up with the children that she's born to other men. Her husband is no longer willing to take her back. She may call herself by his name as Mrs, but he will not have her back. She may even give his name to her illegitimate children, but he will not have her back. Friends, some today, it's the same. You can call yourself Christian, you can go to church, but still be a million miles from God, can't you? The church itself can profess it is Christian, but still nowhere be near God. The worldwide Anglican Church has any number of people who are ordained as priests and consecrated as bishops who do not know God, who are not acceptable to God, and whose prayers are not heard by God. And that's the denomination I belong to. I won't mention the others. You see, God is no respecter of persons. Jesus said on the judgment day, on that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. How awful. You finally say, yes, yes, I'm coming back, I'm coming back, only to be told you're not welcome. And so there is the warning of trouble at the border. Verses 8 to 12. Blow the horn in Gibeah, the trumpet in Ramah, sound the alarm at Beth Avon. We follow you, O Benjamin. Ephraim shall become a desolation in the day of punishment among the tribes of Israel. I make known what is sure. The princes of Judah have become like those who move the landmark. Upon them I will pour out my wrath like water. Ephraim is oppressed, crushed in judgment because he was determined to go after filth. But I am like a moth to Ephraim and dry rot to the house of Judah. The invasion is coming. The destruction of God is going to bring through the Assyrians is certain. Ephraim is about to become a desolation. Benjamin is also going to come into the problem. Indeed, Judah and the princes of Judah are going to be punished like men who move, a, uh, move the, the fence post and who cheat and steal by that method. God is pouring out his wrath upon Ephraim because Ephraim was determined to go after filth. Remember, this is being said 30 or 40 years before the events. This is being said at the time when you couldn't see the cloud on the horizon of the storm that was about to break forth on them because they lived in such prosperity, they lived in such peace. 
So the image changes there in verse 12, not just is it going to kind of great destruction from outside via Assyria, but there's rot inside as well. For verse 12 talks of being like a moth, being like dry rot in the house of Judah. You see, friends, in this last decade, we have lived through a magnificent time of growth and wealth and prosperity. But inside the system that produced such wealth, there was rot. There was the moth eating. And the recession has come as a massive surprise, like the people who are living in a house full of white ants. It catches you by surprise that actually the timbers aren't strong enough to bear the weight any longer. The bankers who were making such money didn't see it coming. The prophet of doom in the 1990s would be laughed at. But yet, he would be right. Hosea looked at the wealthy, prosperous northern kingdom and said, it's full of moth. Looked at Judah, it's full of dry rot. The house is crumbling under the authority of God, but there is no point turning to the king who cannot heal you. For that is what Israel kept doing. They kept turning to Assyria. So verse 13, when Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his wound, then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent to the eighth king, but he's not able to cure you or heal your wound. For I will be like a lion to Ephraim and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away. I will carry off and no one shall rescue. Assyria was coming at the behest of God, coming to destroy Israel and Judah. But Israel kept on going to Assyria, to the very people who are going to destroy us. It's kind of like our present recession, isn't it? We keep going to the bankers who got us into the difficulty for advice as to how to get out of it. The very economists who caused the chaos are the very people who are now going to help us out of it. Well, Assyria is coming. I can see it now coming, so I'll go and make a peace treaty with it. And when things are not going so well there, I'll go down to Egypt, make a peace treaty down with a king in Egypt. But these people can't heal you. These people are going to wound you. These people can't cure, can't heal. Only God can. And so Israel keeps going. Keeps going to Assyria for peace and for treaty and to pay some more tribute to, to be left alone. Or they'd go to Egypt for protection from Assyria. But only God can protect. These kings could not heal. They were killing Israel and Judah. These kings could not protect Israel or Judah from God's wrath because God was coming like a ravenous lion to, to destroy, to eat. Aren't you glad you came to Bible study today? You've got to admit, chapter 5 is one of the cheeriest chapters you've ever come across. Not. It really is a dreadful chapter, isn't it? You cannot return to God because your deeds won't permit it. And if you do seek the Lord, you'll find that he's gone away and has withdrawn from you. And if you go to anybody else, to any other king, he can't heal you or cure you. All you can see in Hosea 5 is the inevitable coming wrath of God bearing down upon your guilt and shame that you have no way of dealing with because you can't turn away from it and even if you do turn away from it, God's not going to listen to you. This is a dreadful chapter. But there's one verse left. One verse left, verse 15. I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face and in their distress earnestly seek me. God tells of his plan to return to return home, to return to the place where the prodigal can come, to return to the place where the prodigal can return, 
to wait for the guilty to seek him, to wait for the distressed to seek him out earnestly. Friends, there was hope for Israel. There was hope for Judah. God would come home and would be at home for those who returned to him. And so chapter 6 immediately starts, Come, let's return to the Lord. For he has torn that he may heal, he has struck us down, that he will bind us up, and after two days he'll revive us, and on the third day he will raise us up that we might live before him. You see verse 15 of chapter 5, I will return for those who desire me. And so the prophet says, come on, let's go back while we can. Yes, he's going to destroy, but he's going to destroy so as to raise us up to raise us up on the third day, to live not our old way but his way, to raise us up that we, verse 2 of chapter 6, may live before him. There is hope. There is salvation. There is a new start. There is life after death. On the third day, notice, he will raise us up to live not our old way but his way before him. But my friends, that hope, is only sought, that hope is only found by those who grasp the hopelessness of their situation. In chapters 5, verses 1 to 14. So let me ask, will God hear our prayers? Does he hear your prayers? The Psalms say that if I cherished sin in my heart, the Lord will not hear my prayers. And that's still true, friends. I cannot come to God in prayer. I cannot come in the name of Jesus if I do not want God's answer, if I do not want God's way, if I do not want God's solution to my problems. If I still want to live my own way, I cannot go to God in prayer. It's like going to God in the name of Yahweh in order to worship the Baals. If I cherish sin in my heart, God will not listen to my prayers. I need to seek him out. I need to seek him genuinely. For otherwise God will not be at home when I call. It's what the Bible calls for is repentance. Real genuine, at depth, in detail, repentance. Repentance is not an apology. It's not saying sorry. Why, you can say sorry without even saying sorry, can't you? You can say, I'm sorry I made you feel bad. I'm not sorry I did it. I'm just sorry I made you feel bad. You can apologise without even apologising today. No, repentance is not apology. It's not just feeling sorry. It's turning. It's turning back from all that you've done, rejecting all that you've done, turning back to God. It's not just running away from the fire, turning to God and yoga and astrology and a bit of new age at the same time. No, it's turning back to God. It's as David said when David was caught in great sin and repented. David said, you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it to you. You'll not be pleased with burnt offerings for the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. It's easy to offer a sacrifice. It's easy to pay for a lamb to be burnt. It's, it's easy to deal lightly with sin, but dealing lightly with sin does not deal with sin at all. For God brings to us that sacrifice that pays for all our sin in the death of his son. And so through his death and through his resurrection on the third day, God brought the new age for us when those who truly repent, those who earnestly seek him, those who genuinely want to go home from the pigsty that their life has found themselves in, they will find forgiveness that is full, forgiveness that is free, forgiveness that has been won for us by God. 
look on the back of this uh, outline that you have, the green outline, and see down the bottom of it, under the advertisement about our Sunday gatherings, is a prayer. It's the kind of prayer you need to pray to come back to God. Let me just read it to you there quickly. You see, in the first paragraph, it acknowledges that my life is a mess. I need forgiveness. In the second paragraph, it thanks God for what he has done, sending his son to pay the penalty for me, rise, raising him up on the third day to give me a new start. And so the third paragraph is the prayer of the prayer. Please forgive me. Please change me that I may live with Jesus as my ruler. I'm going to lead this in prayer in a few moments in this prayer, and I'm going to invite you to pray it with me in the quietness of your own mind and heart to God. But you know, you, you could teach a parrot to rattle out a prayer like that, couldn't you? It won't make the parrot a Christian. But if this is genuinely your desire, that our Lord Jesus Christ died that you be forgiven and rose again, to give you a new start. So will you pray with me? Let's pray. Dear God, I know that I'm not worthy to be accepted by you. I don't deserve your gift of eternal life. I am guilty of rebelling against you and ignoring you. I need forgiveness. Thank you for sending your son to die for me that I may be forgiven. Thank you that he rose from the dead to give me new life. Please forgive me and change me that I may live with Jesus as my ruler. Amen.